welcome. On the show tonight, the man who's, he who's heading what many would regard as that most futile of sporting enterprises, trying to take the America's Cup from the Yanks. But then he's used to battling against the odds. He started life as a sign writer and now runs a business empire worth $200 million. He's Mr. Alan Bond. Another of my guests also started life working with paint. In this case, he didn't get sidetracked, but continued his craft to become one of Australia's leading artists, and here's Mr. John Olson. Now, my first guest is best described as Australia's most popular girl singer. She also conquered Britain when she starred in the West End production of the musical Irene. Latterly, she's been working in America and is due to return there soon to work. She, she is therefore surely an international star. Not bad for someone born in Lamaru, I think it is, and christened Julie Moncrief Lush. Ladies and gentlemen, Julie Anthony. <laughs> I'm sorry I hesitated over Lamaru. It sounds like an extraordinary place. Uh, that's how you say it, Lamaru. Lamaru, mm -hmm. that's right. And it was lush you were born with. Julie Moncrief lush. A fell of a handle, isn't it? It's a, it's a hard one, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Why did you change it, in fact? Well, it started actually very early on. Actually, my first public appearance, my first professional public appearance, was in um, Tasmania after winning a talent quest. And I went on one night and they said, ladies and gentlemen, would I like to introduce Miss Julie Lush? And they all went <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> Because th the place was full of Americans on tour. And I used to see them during the day standing at the billboard in front of the foyer in, in the hotel all going, no! Nah! <laughs> you know, it can't be really her name they're all saying. And it got a little bit off-putting going on stage and having everybody going, you know, uproarious laughter. Yeah. So I figured... I'd have to change. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to, but I, I had to. Yeah. You, mm. in, you, in fact, you started life, didn't you, as, as Miss Lush? Um, I certainly a, did. Uh, <laughs> in, a, in a farm, on a farm. Yes, yeah. yes, I, I was born and raised on a farm. That's right. What do I mean, what, what, was the music in your family? Yeah, actually, never professionally, not for generations back. I once had a, a great, great, I think possibly great grandfather who used to ride his bike from Victor Harbour to Adelaide, which is about 60 miles, to sing at the town hall. And that's the only thing I've ever be a been able to trace mm. in the ancestry at all. Mum and Dad have got terrific voices. My brother uh, sang professionally for five years in, here in Sydney. He's now living in Adelaide. So it's there. My uncle used to sing Amateur Gilbert and Sullivan. And that's about basically it. What was, in fact, your childhood like, though? Because it seems a fairly un unlikely beginning for somebody who's now a sort of big singing star to be reared on a farm. I mean, what was it like? Mm, was it... I had a terrific childhood. Did you? Yes. Um, I always remember everything. We were always very happy. Uh, it was a great atmosphere. We, I've always lived in small towns. I moved from Lamaru when I was nine to an even smaller place called Galga. And there was a population of about, oh, in the immediate area, about 30 people, which is only a few families. Mm. And I had five in my school class, four boys and me. And <laughs> that was a battle. <laughs> and uh, so I always, it was a very stable upbringing. I was, were you tomboyish? Absolutely. Were you? Absolutely. Not until I went to Galga. When I was living in Namaru up until I was about eight years old, I was terribly feminine. I used to go to school in the rope petticoats and the little cotton dresses and everything. And went to Galga the first day dressed like that. And the girls were all in shorts and thongs. And I went, oh, I felt terrible. And they all climbed trees and played marbles and things that I'd never done. <laughs> and played football because there wasn't enough boys in the team. So it took me about half a day to get into that swing. <laughs> I was climbing trees with the best of them. What, what kind of a child were you physically, physically though? Were you, were you a gawky child? Terribly. I yeah. was this height when I was about 11 years old. And people used to say to me, oh, she's going to be just like her father, who was six feet two. <laughs> and when you're 11 years old and you have visions of being six feet two, you panic. And I used to go around like this because all my girlfriends were short. And there she'd be like the leader of the pack and, and all the shorter girlfriends coming along behind me. Mm. And I always got in the position of playing goalie for the basketball because I was the nearest to the net, you know? <laughs> Things like nearest that. Nearest to heaven. Did yes. you play any, any boys' sports? Because you mentioned being oh, tomboy. Yes. Well, what did you play? Yes, well, you had to at school. Uh, football, you Australian football? rules. Uh -huh. mm. <laughs> My father used to play for professional Australian rules in Adelaide in 1936, 37, 38. And so I grew up with it all the time. I used to 
it used to be my brother's warm-up practice on Saturday mornings. I used to always have to put on the great big clumpy boots and go out there and kick the football so he'd practice his marking and everything, you see. And at school I was full back. Mm -hmm. mm. And I used to threaten the boy, I had to stand. I used to say, don't you touch me. Because um, I'm a girl, you've got to stay behind. You know, I used to try all that, never worked, but I tried. <laughs> Must have been a delight marking you, actually. Oh, I was, oh, I was, I had a terrific aim. I could, you know, do all that. I could shoot through the goals, no trouble, if I could just get the ball. What was the, what was any inkling at this time, in this sort of tomboy era of yours, that you wanted to perform at all, that you wanted to become a singer at, on stage? None Absolutely at all. Absolutely not. You wanted to be a, what, a farmer? Yes, I was going to be the first ever lady farmer that ever was that managed her farm and did all the work herself. Uh, delusions of grandeur a bit. But I always used to work with my dad outside when I'd finished helping mum. I used to rush outside and dad used to teach me how to fix engines and start engines and we had a, a lighting plant, as it's called, for electricity. We didn't have these mains electricity. And so I used to have to start the engine and hook up all the electricity to, to get it through to the house so I could do all that. You were in fact uh, Miss Rural Youth as well, weren't you? Yes. That's how it's coming. <laughs> it's all coming out Isn't now. It? Yeah, but but what what did you I mean? What's Miss Rural Youth to start with? I mean, was it a beauty contest? No. Oh. It was farming knowledge. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Rotation of crops and things. You had to know about manure and all that sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, I used to help Dad shear the sheep. It was Dad and I used to shear about all oh, four thousand sheep. And we used to do it in our own good time. Dad had used to say, oh, I had enough today. And we'd finish after doing about 30 sheep, you see. <laughs> and I used to class the wool. Dad taught me how to do it. What was your, what was your first uh, stage performance, though, as a child? Can you remember that? Yes, that was at Lamaru in a school concert. I was a tree. A tree? <laughs> yes. That's a very promising day. <laughs> you can only go up from that point. You, you can, know that really. Right? I suppose. I quite enjoyed it because no one could see me. They wrapped all this very heavy-duty brown paper from my trunk, and I held this big, enormous branch of mallee tree, and, but they wrapped me up before I got up the stairs, you see, and I ripped my trunk getting up the stairs. <laughs> and I sang the teddy bear's picnic. A tree sang the teddy bear's picnic. Yes. <laughs> oh, several trees. Yes. I wasn't the only one. Oh, I see. Uh, a chorus mm. line of trees. I was very happy because I didn't want to be a, a teddy bear or a fairy, you see. And uh -huh. I got to be a tree. But this, this, this it, it suited you because you were wrapped up, parceled up, so people mm. couldn't see you as you really were. Abs they, they could hear me. They knew I was there, but they couldn't see me. And I, I used to sang, I sang my heart out because I didn't get nervous or anything. Well, but, but how therefore, this is fascinating, I mean, the thing about being so shy, how therefore did you get the nerve to make your very first professional uh, debut? Not easily. No. It was difficult. You, you could hardly walk on wrapped in brown paper. No, <laughs> I wish I could have. No. Uh, what it, was it? It the... came about completely by surprise and by accident, actually, because my dad, our local shopping area was about 50 miles from Galga. It was called Wakery. And Dad was up there getting all our week's groceries and things, and he was talking to a friend of his whose son had the only band along that whole River Murray area. And he said that their singer had just disappeared overnight, and they didn't have a singer for their high school ball, you see. And they didn't know what they were going to do. And Dad said, oh, well, Julie is always singing around the house all day. She must know two or three songs and help you out. And the chap went, oh, terrific. <laughs> Dad came home and said, well... You better get to basketball practice because we're going out tonight and uh, you're going to sing at the high school ball. And I just looked at him and I thought, what have you done? And I was terrified. And my girlfriend still remember the time that I went to basketball practice and kept looking at my watch all, every three seconds saying, what time is it? What time is it? And they couldn't understand because I couldn't tell anybody. I was too embarrassed to say that I was going to go and sing that night. How do you sing the songs, though? I mean, how do you get on stage? I was more or less pushed. And I, I think I looked at the floor and sang three songs, and the knees were going dang, dang, dang. <laughs> and I, it was the worst experience I think I'd ever had up to that point. Yes. And I hated it. The, 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 big, the big breakthrough in your career, of course, I suppose, one of, well, not the breakthrough, but one of the, uh, the landmarks in your career was, was Irene, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Yeah. Mm. Uh, how did, did you chase that, or did it drop in your lap? Dropped in my lap. Did it? Mm. Uh, it seems it's happened pretty much all the way along somehow. I've been very lucky. Uh, I actually went to audition for one of the chorus parts in A Little Night Music and Betty Pounder was taking the auditions and she was, had the seed of Irene in her mind and it was really not even in the planning stages. And she went back to Williamson's and said, I found a girl to do a show that I think we should do. And they said, oh, fine, uh, that sounds interesting. What's she done? And she said, well, nothing. She's never been on stage and never acted before and you could see their faces sinking. <laughs> And she kept 
encouraging them, and they they did it. They took the gamble. It's, it's an amazing Cinderella story, isn't it? That, yes, you know, very that much. It only so. happens in, in novels. It was, mm. of course, you went to London with it as well and became a very big star in London. I remember the press reaction was absolutely incredible, and you must remember it too. Yes, yeah, so. I. But it was also during that time, was it not, that you started having this trouble with your throat? Yes. So I remember the last time I was in Australia a year ago, you were just recovering from mm -hmm. an operation, I think, that you had on it. That's what right. exactly was the problem? Well, and What used to happen when you were singing? Well, it started, as you said, at the, be the end of the run in, of Irene in London. It was just my voice was... The range was diminishing. Uh, I couldn't get the tops or the bottoms. I seemed to have a very small middle range. And it was getting very hoarse. It was just not right. You know, I didn't know what was wrong. I was going to specialists and they couldn't find anything. And uh, I, this went on for three years. They kept, my voice kept uh, cutting out. Actually, it hemorrhaged on stage three times in that three years. And I had no warning. It was never sore. And it just used to cut right out. That was it. And uh, in the middle of a show, which was a bit embarrassing. And you couldn't sing at all after that? No. Once it, once it no. I just used to have to get off stage in the best possible way that I could. So it was, it was a real cloud over my head. I it was must have been. Mm, becoming very uncertain of what I was doing. And what was medical opinion about it? Did well, you... finally, um, I had a laryn micro laryngoscopy where they put the microscope down your throat mm -hmm. to have a look. And he found, just on the back edge of the cords, a thing that's technically known as spider nebus, which is a selection of, a collection of blood capillaries mm -hmm. in a spidery fashion. Mm -hmm. And of course, under stress, the capillaries would blow up and burst and hemorrhage. And it took three years to, to find it, because it was hidden. And what, you, you had surgery on that then, did you? And yes, I had to go to Germany and uh, was operated microsurgery over there uh, about 14 months ago now. Mm -hmm. uh, and no trouble since? No, that would. And the voice is what, well, uh, from what I heard, uh, the Royal Variety performance, better than ever, actually. Well, I'm getting back, uh, I think I have got back my original range and power now, which was, I was losing up and all that time. So I'm really pleased. When, be before you did the, uh, I had the operation, you had to rest your voice, did you not? Yes. How long was it before, or do, for how long did you not talk? Three months. You didn't say, utter a word for three months? No. You must have been a joy to be with. <laughs> yeah, everyone. I'll tell you what, and I'm glad I didn't interview you at that time. It would been a smashing interview, mm -hmm. wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Everyone used to say to Ed, oh, it must be bliss having a wife who can't speak. And Ed said it was, it, was, it was quite nice for about two days, and then he found himself talking to himself. And it was terrible. Actually, it was, he got very good at reading my mind so that if I was getting frustrated and couldn't get out what I wanted to say, because you can't think about it. If you think, try and think a word, your chords move. And that, really? Yes, and that was forbidden too, you see. The chords were never to meet. They had to heal by keeping apart. They're a V-shape. And if you think and get really frustrated about something, you try and say a word, your chords start to come together. So that was a good trick. I had to remain totally calm about everything. <laughs> Extraordinary. Yeah. Well, was, there, was, there, was there any moment where you nearly forgot that, that you were... Oh, yes, yeah. I, I mean, did you pick the phone up and then say nothing when it rang? Yeah, I, I, I used to go like this for the first couple of days yeah. and then I'd go, what can I do, you know? So we had to buy a message machine when, if Ed was out and put the message on saying, mm. you know, this is Eddie Knapp, I've left the house, <laughs> Julie can't talk. What about if people came to the door and Ed wasn't there and you opened the door? Oh, it was, go just, like it was terrible. I, yeah, I, a couple of times I had to. I'd write, get the pe pencil and paper and say, I can't talk. I have laryngitis, that was the best way to put it, yeah. you know. And yeah. they'd go, oh, and we'd do sign language, try and, you know, get by. It was very hard for about a week, but surprisingly enough, after that time, you forget that you ever could talk somehow. Your body seems to go into it. You know you can't, so you don't even try. It was an interesting experience. I became a terrific listener. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what about, what, what was the, going back before that, when you said that it, your, your voice first had a cracking up on, on stage, what was the, the, the worst moment for you on stage, do you think, ever? I think it was probably at the talk of the town in London. Um, it was something that I'd always wanted to do. Uh, I had done Irene, had had a certain amount of trouble with my voice, but it seemed to settle down. And this was almost a year later. I went back to do uh, the talk of the town and was 45 minutes into a, an hour show, and it went. And I had a, a very uh, bad hemorrhage there. And I couldn't talk, as I said before. I couldn't explain what was going on. I just had to do sign language to the musical director to cut to the last song which meant cutting out about three or four songs, and just get off. 
Consequently, it was reported in, in one of the papers that Miss Anthony left the stage rather abruptly and didn't thank the orchestra. Uh, but there, it was just an awful situation. That, that it was going well and I suddenly had to go mm. and not be able to say why. There's also cynicism in some quarters too, wasn't there, about it? The yes, there was a little, although I can understand it. Some of uh, the people over there thought that I just didn't want to do any mm. more of the show and wanted to leave the country. And that was probably the worst moment I've ever had in my career, uh, that they could think that, but then again, they didn't know me, you see. And I can understand it, but at the same time, I didn't understand it, you mm. know what I mean? It was rather nasty for a while until they found out that I actually did have a problem. Mm. I had to go to several throat specialists and be certified that I was unfit to perform and all that, you know. Well, all that now is, is, is uh, gladly past you, and, mm -hmm. and you've been recently in, in America. You're going back there. Does that mean to say that you're going to go over there and make your entire career in, in America? No, no. I, I could never live anywhere else you but couldn't. here. No, I'm an Aussie through and through. I love it. I can't tell you why particularly. It's just something in the air, I think. Mm. I think it's a tremendous place to live. Uh, but it's also great to get away and experience other work areas. And America's a, a great place to work. Mm. So I'm trying to get two summers a year. <laughs> I can work a summer over there and a summer here and get rid of the winters. That's a nice idea. Yeah. Right. You don't have winters in Australia. You're joking. You call Not this really. winter. Not really. There'll be no. sunbathing in Bali. That's right. Oh, they would too. <laughs> <laughs> now, what about this 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 song that you've uh, you, you've recorded recently? Um, it's in fact the what the first song, first original song that you recorded. First song first ever written for written me. Written for you. Mm. Right. Mm. Yes, by Robbie Porter, mm -hmm. who's a tremendous songwriter. He's done such a lot for our industry here, and. Uh, uh, I finished doing the vocals in uh, L.A. just uh, last week. Mm -hmm. And what's it it's, called? I've only said I love you in my mind. I've only said I love you in my mind. Right, Julie, Mr. Tico and his band of itinerant rogues are <laughs> you over there. Would I you, shouldn't join them. You would you? Thank you very I much. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Julie Anthony. Try. 
Right, I right enjoyed that. Thank you. That was smashing. Not bad for a last call, Julie Lush. Very good. <laughs> Julie Anthony, for the moment, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. <laughs> right. My next guest tonight has risen from drawing what his religious school teachers called gutter girls to become one of Australia's leading painters. He painted the most viewed work in Australia, the 70-foot-long mural in the Sydney Opera House, which, it's calculated, has been seen by 14 million people. The Australian's art critic once said of him, and I quote, uh, he is the man who gave Australia, Australian art a highly valuable kick in the middle of its refined good taste. Ladies and gentlemen, John Olson. <laughs> John, um, did you, like uh, Julie, have little or no ambition to be what you've eventually become when you were a, a child? I, I was very envious, and the only thing that um, I envied her for is that um, she had a slightly easier trip than I did. Why was that? Well, because um, in my own house, there were no paintings at all, there were no singers, and definitely no painters, yeah. and there were no there were no pictures that one could see. Um, and so, therefore, like, I was a happy child, uh, just very haptic in which but I just kept drawing and drawing. My, my poor mother's cookbooks were all with these awful scrolls by John Olson. Terrible, really, just absolutely revolting. But what, what did you copy most of all, though? You said there weren't any paintings in the house. Mm -hmm. any but, so, therefore, what was your source of inspiration? What did you practice upon? Well, you see, there is a very strange thing that happens with uh, Australian arts, uh, you know, perhaps as the poet A.D. Hope put it, that Australians pullulate on the edge of a saucer, meaning that they live in Brisbane and Melbourne and Sydney and Adelaide. They don't really go into the interior. And what is meant with, like, 14 million Australians, which you described, as seen my mural, that's the population of Australia. Mm. Mm. Um, and what it really means is that um, we live in these places like I was brought up in Sydney. And what happens in that is that we have a vast suburbia with, like if one was to think of Europe, for example, that say in Yorkshire you'd have, um, you know, a church or a building that you can relate to. A pub. Um, well, that's traditional. And that um, there would be some kind of cultural point in which you could say, there I can see a picture, there I can see an old building, and there I can know what my past is. Now, with an immense suburbia, like we have, for example, in Sydney, that goes out almost to the Blue Mountains, that there are none of the, there are no places there, and it could be described that I have no no past, no present, or perhaps no future. And what's happened, like be it from Sidney Nolan's father, who was a tram driver, my own father, who was a sort of a salesman, mm. that um, we we had no sort of cultural link which we could directly relate to. So therefore you find with Charles Blackman, uh, myself, uh, so many really good Australian artists that they began as doing comics. Really? And like comic strips? Yeah. Mm. How, how could I do anything else? There was nothing else. I mm. mean, like my whole sort of cultural sort of mafia was like given to me by the press and like be a Donald Duck or, or anything like that, that that was the criteria that I only knew. Uh, now, uh, I'm sure you'd appreciate this, that that would be impossible for Europeans. Mm. Yes, I mean, you're, you're cluttered with culture, actually. I mean, it's, there's yes. a cultural reference buried up to there, aren't mm. you, in it? All the cultural time. mothballs. That's right, cultural mm. mothballs, mm. exactly right. That's, that's mm. fascinating. That. Mm. But, but, I mean, what's interesting also is what were, or who were these gutter girls that your religious school teachers objected to you drawing? Well, Michael, like, um, the school I went to was, like, very religious. And my aim was, um, in the early part of the year, to get right down to the back of the class and just sort of get on with the scene. I was hopeless at maths and 
really, when I look at my early life, a total catastrophe. <laughs> um, <laughs> in a certain sense, I don't think it's changed. <laughs> <laughs> um, the gutter girls might I add, for those who are, uh, of us who are old enough, was Betty Grable. Really? In which that I tried to make the tits like sort of like the biggest in the business. Uh, I want everyone to understand that I'm in puberty and very romantic. And with those long legs and those incredible stiletto shoes that really turned me on. Just, just <laughs> so good. Watch yourself, Julie. You're a funny actor. Yes, watch out, baby. Actually, I was watching you before, and I'll tell you, it's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> so you used to copy... That's a famous pin-up, isn't it, of mm. Betty Grable in the white yes. one-piece bathing costume? Mm. The one that's it's alleged sustained an army through a wall. Well, I think the, arna, the army was at the state of masturbation. Oh, you reckon so? Mm. That's probably why we won. Um, <laughs> Well, I don't know the Japanese side of it, Michael. <laughs> well, they used to, they used to oh, got, they, this bit will get taken out. They used to have those yes. little rubber women, the Japanese, you know. Mm. You know that? Well, uh, I think they had a greater technocracy than we have. That's right. Yes. Well, let's get this conversation... <laughs> <laughs> let's get this conversation back on a proper, um, a proper yes. level. One that's yes. fit for that suburbia which you talked about. Yes. Right. Mm. Um, I forgot what I was going to ask you now. <laughs> uh, I know where I was going. You sat through that without blushing, which is more could be said for me. <laughs> I'm going to ask you about that mural, yes. That you, you said what, seen by 14 million people, the population of Australia. Mm. Now, the mural, in fact, tells a story, doesn't it? I've seen it, actually. Mm. But what, what is the story that you're depicting in that mural? Oh, well, it, it's an incredible story. Um, it's the story of um, uh, an Australian artist who um, uh, drowned... Um, opposite where the concert hall now is. Now, in order to explain this story uh, fullest, which we'll have to do, and perhaps fullest is the word, that um, Kenneth Slasser, the poet, wrote this remarkable poem. It's one of the great poets, poems of the 30s, called Five Bells. And it really is to do with time. And the basic story is, though, that, like, there was um, 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 a leftist newspaper known as Smith's Weekly. Yes. Right. And there was this uh, artist known as Joe Lynch, and they were in the pub opposite, and they were going to a party at Mossman. And it was just about, I mean, I don't want to tell you this, Michael, just about this time of year. And that, and they left the pub... And Joe Lynch had a big overcoat on, and his, his overcoat was stuffed with beer bottles. And they got on to the uh, Mossman Ferry down at Circular Quay, and there was much, as Slessor describes it, much jollity, my God. And suddenly they found that Lynch was no longer there, and they pulled the ferry around, and they looked for him, and... He was never found. Um, some cynical Australian said to me it was a true Australian death. Well, it, it, um, I mean, I don't understand that. Well, I wouldn't dare no. comment on that. No, no, I mean, because you can't. No. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> it's not a bad way to go, actually, with your pocket full of tins of beer, is it? I mean, down like that. But that's what you celebrated then, this poem, in this, tab in this mural. Yes, well, there's only two kinds of people in life, lovers and others. Uh -huh. And definitely, Joe Lynch was a lover. Was a lover. All mm. right, then. Well, we've got on film here. We've got mm. the, the mural. Oh, the, mm. the, yes, the mural. Uh, let's have a look at it now. Now, yes. can you sort of tell us what it's all about? Is well, it first of all, that what I'm trying to do I in the mural is to give, like, a moon-like kind of thing. Now, at this particular point, that there is the head of Joe Lynch, which is only the head, and there are squid and fish holding on to that head, which is symbolical of the fact that he is becoming part of the sea. And throughout that, there is the joining line of... Now, look, there we have... And uh, everyone accused me... Say, oh, God, John Olson, you're so abstract, you poor little wretch, I can't understand what you're saying. That triangular <laughs> sign is the very sign that is in the middle of the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Right. And if you notice throughout the mural, there is that sort of bell sign going through it. Right. And be... And throughout the mural, there are signs of plankton, there are fish signs, as though that, like, there is... It is an elegy. It's a story of 
like dedication to that man. Now, as I say, it's been viewed by an awful lot of people. And in fact, you were working in the Opera House, weren't you, at the time that workmen were there completing, mm -hmm. uh, the finishing the building. I should imagine there's quite a bit of conflict, wasn't there? Earthy conflict between the the um, the guys working, the labourers down there, and this artist doing this creative mural. Yes, well, I'm bananas. I mean, you know, like 20 cents in the dollar. <laughs> and um, we were doing fine. It took two years to do that mural. And we were doing fine, like we had to have it vertically, because the whole thing is curved. Mm. And then we had to have it, like, laid down horizontally, which looked like a Chinese bridge. And, but I knew that the complexity of the light was such there that we'd have to finish it in the opera house itself. That's where the total catastrophe begins. Like, I knew it wasn't finished. They thought it was bloody awful. The workers? Oh, yes. Did they? Yes. They told you so. Oh, then. yes. Oh, no trouble. Like, my five-year-old child can do it. My reply is, I'll send you to my dealer. <laughs> or um, one of the things that I'll be, you'll be sued for that, and I said, I can't help you there. But uh, so it goes. I mean, we, we artists are used to being insulted. You know, yeah, but this is incessant, was it, every day? Every friend? day, every day. Well, that must be very distracting. Well, I... You, the Pope was impatient with Michelangelo. <laughs> <laughs> you knew how he felt. Yeah. Well, he gave him a few more years, even though the paint kept running down his hand. <laughs> and that in the midst of life, you see, you don't know this, in the midst of life, you are in Australia. And that I knew that front up or shut up. And I really sort of got onto it and I refused to give in. So I got two bodyguards. Bodyguards? Mm. <laughs> Where did you get them from? Well, one was a remarkable wrestler um, <laughs> in the 30s known uh, as the Human Bomb, which he used to... Human <laughs> Bomb. <laughs> <laughs> throw himself against the sort of ring and just knock his opponent out. Uh, and, um, and his ears were very close to both... Uh, his nose was very close to both of his ears. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I'd love to paint his portrait, yeah. but I'm not good enough. Mm -hmm. uh, the other was a bouncer at the cross in the 30s, and believe me, that was very, like, heavy time. Those gentlemen looked after me very well. Did they? Mm. What, what, they used to stand flank you, did they? When you that's were, right. And what, that's right. what would they do if, if anybody criticised? Well, I said, uh, Mr. Olsen's busy. <laughs> <laughs> must have been a remarkable experience. Did they ever have to bounce anybody, literally? I mean, did they pick them up and sort of throw them into the, into the pond? Well, I think somehow the geography of their face has fixed everything. It did. <laughs> <laughs> now, does it... Does, what, what, does, is it a matter of pride to you that 14 million people have seen this, uh, this mural? Oh, of course it is. And um, in all modesty, it's the best mural ever done in Australia. <laughs> <coughs> well, we can only take his word for it, can't we, Julie? <laughs> mm. Absolutely. Can you mm. think of a better one? <laughs> well, right, we'll pass on then. Mm. But you also... You've, you've taken us one or two... Um, distinguished visitors around as well. You once took mm. Prince Philip. Now, he's not renowned, I think I'm right in saying, in having a, a keen appreciation of modern art, is he? Well, um, there are certain circles, and uh, I wouldn't get into it, where he's known as Prince Philistine. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, uh, um, I wish they'd sell this show to England. Go on. <laughs> and, uh, um, like, there was only two things that he and the um, Shah of Iran had, was their common hatred for modern art. Um, and, like, I must say that the Queen was hopeless uh, in art. I mean, I think she's a splendid lady and oozes full of all of the virtues which, like, most Australian women will never have. Uh, and she stands for an elegance and, like, we were aiming to be better. Um, but I gave her up. <laughs> and um, uh, my most charming wife, who I said, look after, will you? <laughs> and I'd been with Prince Philip, uh, uh, who incidentally is, uh, he has a very good feeling for Australia. And I'd been on expeditions with him in um, sort of, you know, looking at wildlife and things like that. He really is 
marvelous, really remarkable. And, um, and so he got on to me, and we're strolling along like it's like, like walking down the avenue, like the Boulevard Saint Michel or wherever, it's, except it happens to be the Sydney Opera House mural. And we're looking along, and he, and, and he says, what's this about? Olson. And I said, sir, it, it's about like the harbour at night. Uh, you know, I feel infantile. Um, you know, like sensible cretin that I'm trying to be. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, and the parts that I've shown you and explaining, and he thinks, Christ, what have I got here? <laughs> you know. And, and, and then, when we get to the, and I'm saying to him, sir, like it's about, like, the harbour at, at moonlight. And he says to me, yes, but where's Luna Park? <laughs> Um, <laughs> what I had to say was, I mean, little Ollie Polly has to have some defence. I say, sir, it's in the next mural. <laughs> are you are you satisfied with it though? After seven years? Oh, I think it's marvellous. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, look, uh, to explain it uh, a bit further, is that I would never say that in Europe. But we don't really have a mural tradition. And I do think that when you see that mural at night, it has a soul, mm -hmm. a feeling. I love it. <laughs> do, you, do you still work on it? Oh, yes. Uh, that's where, uh, uh, Michael, I'm very disappointed about that. Why? Because I never finished it in time. You didn't? And I've gone back many times and made drastic changes to it. Really? And the thing that disappoints me, nobody's ever noticed. <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't need the human bomb anymore, then? No, well, he retired. He retired, yes. He retired into silent wrestling. <laughs> <laughs> what about, you, you are now, um, you're the judge on, what, three of the leading art competitions in, in Australia, aren't mm. you? And you mentioned, so therefore, you've got a very keen insight into the, the new kind of art that's coming, the new painters. Um, you mentioned earlier, at the beginning of this interview, about there being no tradition in... In, uh, in Australian art, and that uh, you drew yours from comic books and this sort of thing. Were other kids coming through drawing from that same tradition, or have they found something else? Uh, I think we're doing um, very much better in Australia. Uh, like, um, we've got a lot of um, travelling shows, like big Chinese exhibitions, or shows from Russia, or, you know, great paintings from Europe. I think that the, uh, the chord of us being so lost in the antipodes is really being broken. Uh, you know, I think that anyone who knew that awful, like, loneliness that we experienced in the 30s and 40s is now broken. Maybe it's to do with sort of great airlines or mm. something like that. That we, I think that in Australia we're plussing. That we are uh, sort of educating our young people better and above all, that the Australian public are coming to the party. Oh, well, that's interesting mm. because, I mean, the, the popular conception <laughs> would be among Australians, I would think, they'd put themselves down about art, pretend that was a bit sissy, wouldn't they? Are you saying that they've got mm. a, um, a, a, a proper appreciation of art here? The well, public? look, um, we could explain it this way in very simple terms that 125,000 people saw the centenary test. 250,000 people saw the Chinese exhibition. And I think that, like, this is where a false image of Australians of being, like, cultureless is entirely wrong. I think that they are very much into it and that they want to know and the isolation thing, I think, is now building up an incredible curiosity, uh, you know? Uh, I, I'm delighted. John Olson, um, for the moment, thank you very much indeed. <laughs> saying in boating circles which goes like this a yacht is a hole in the water into which you pour money 
Well, to understand fully the implication of that statement, you have to be financing a challenger to the Americans in the famous America's Cup. My final guest tonight has accepted that challenge twice, lost on both occasions, and is about to do it again. His enthusiasm for the impossible brings to mind Dr. Johnson's definition of remarriage, a triumph of optimism over experience. Mind you, he's no stranger to overcoming the odds. He left school at the age of 14, started work as a sign writer, and now controls a business empire worth $200 million, making him one of Australia's richest men. Ladies and gentlemen, Alan Bond. <laughs> Alan, um, let's talk about this America's Cup, first of all. This is your third attempt, or you, you're going into now. Um, have you calculated how much it will, it's cost you, this bid, or these three bids? Well, we've done the last two campaigns with the support of the uh, public, and um, they run at about a million and a half per campaign. Well, that's what it's cost you? For each campaign, uh, it, the total cost is about a million and a half, and I've paid about, a, about uh, half of that. So... I, well, let me work that out. That's one, uh, so you've got about three million dollars personal expenditure. That's right. About that. Is it worth it? Oh, I think so. I think it's very important. Why? Right, but uh, I mean, how much is it a kind of personal ego trip, and how much is it important to Australia? I think it's terribly important to Australia. We've got to uh, understand that some 600 million people see this event. They see Australia uh, in the forerunner of this great competition a competition that hasn't been won for 128 years. Um, we're in there competing, we're getting better. Uh, we've beaten many of the challenges uh, in Europe. Uh, the best that Sweden, with all its technology, can throw against us. We've beaten the best in France. And then we've gone on and we've had two challenges against the Americans that I've been associated with. Um, we're eventually going to win this cup. You are? Yes, we are. Good. Now, they've, they've, I mean, you, you say they've had it for 128 years, the, the Yanks. I mean, they're so determined to keep it, they bolted the damn trophy to the floor of the trophy room, haven't they? I mean, you're going to have to take his mate in, the human bomb, to, to, to get it out. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's because it is extraordinary. What, I mean, I know very little about, about this race, except what I do know, people tell you that even if you won out there in America, you'd have difficulty getting that trophy back. Is that true? Well, I'm sure we'll do, we do a better job than the, the Americans do rescuing, rescuing the hostages. Um, <laughs> it would be just as difficult, I would suggest to you, but uh, no, I think that the event is a sporting event, and uh, when we're good enough, um, we'll win it, and we'll bring it home. How did you first get interested in this? And first of all, how did you get interested in, in yachting, first of all? Well, I became interested in yachting rather unusually. Uh, I was sitting in my office one day, and uh, a salesman rang through, and he said, look, we've... Uh, uh, this chap wants to buy this land from us, and he hasn't got the deposit, but he's got a yacht. And um, it's a racing yacht, and uh, he really wants the land, uh, wants to know we can trade it in. And I said, oh, well, I don't know much about yachting, but uh, sure, if that's what he wants to do, let's, let's take it on. And I never forget, I went down to the yacht club uh, on the Saturday morning, this was on the Thursday, and said, the chap said, oh, look, this is your yacht, you've just bought it. And a 51-foot Bermudian sloop with 10 fine crewmen there, and said, well, are you going to take it in the races today? <laughs> to which I did. And uh, I learnt then that you sailing backwards from the starting line isn't the right way to begin. <laughs> <laughs> what about, but what, what then made you interested in the America's Cup? Was it some particular incident or what? No, I, I got particularly interested in the actual competition itself. I think it's a fine um, outdoor sport to which, uh, you know, we live in an island. Um, Australia is an island and it was founded by um, um, yachts under sail coming to Australia, so it's natural for Australians to be interested in the uh, interest in the sea. And uh, I'd followed this. I'd been in the surf club when I was younger, and it was uh, just progressing along. And uh, I, from this first yacht, I found out that there was a lot more to winning an event than just um, buying a yacht and learning the fundamentals of it. And gradually, I bought another yacht, um, had one built for the first time to my. Uh, specifications. The first one we built with Bob Miller from Sydney and uh, we worked together on that and we made a pretty fine effort of it. We took that yacht to America and in that process I was at, New at uh, the Long Island Sound. I'd been in the r a race there and done pretty well with it. We pulled up that day and um, there was the previous uh, America's Cup uh, Defender. This is 1971. And uh, I said, oh, this is a pretty good lot. yacht. Must go across and have a look. 
So with two or three of our crew then, we walked across to have a look, and this chap came and said, oh, he said, you can't look at that yacht, you know. Uh, I said, oh, we really just want to have a look. He said, oh, no, he said, we, we've got our secrets. We don't want you stealing our secrets. And uh, it was then I thought that uh, here was this yacht that they didn't want us to see. Uh, there must be something about it. And then I started to uh, become particularly interested from that point onwards. When you went to, uh, to when you first, in fact, uh, sailed in the America's Cup, you were described by the Americans as brash, boorish, and uncouth. Now, whatever gave them that idea? <laughs> well, you know, I suppose to them, uh, coming from Australia, uh, as a sign writer and from Western Australia, they'd never even heard of it, you know. I mentioned Perth and they said, oh, that's where Colonel Glenn, t they, someone turned the lights on as he we flew over. And uh, they hadn't heard of Western Australia. Yeah. They didn't even know what size it was. And uh, suddenly having the audacity to come along and challenge the America's Cup from a small place like Perth in Western Australia, that just couldn't be. You had to be um, something other than what you were. Yes. And so they uh, decided they would paint their own picture. And being inexperienced with the press and the media at the time, I probably helped them uh, by saying, well, look, you know, you haven't got the right idea and, and we're really going to win this event and uh, we can do it anyway. And uh, <laughs> uh, not knowing how good the competition was. And so that, uh, unfortunately, they um, picked on one side of the conversation anyway. And they, they got you wrong, did they? <clears throat> well, I think so. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've noticed that um, in this show, actually, I mean, the modesty of Australian men has come to the forefront, hasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but, Julie, did, does it mean anything in your Australia? Does it mean anything to you competing in the Australia's Cup? In America's Cup? Rather? Yeah, it does. I, does I, it? I really think that a lot of the country's well being depends on how well they do in sporting events and things. You know, I think it gives people a heck of a lift to think that, that, it, that we've say we do win the cup. I think it'd be a marvellous ego thing for the country. What about you, John? Does it, does it move you? Well, as an artist, like the voyage of impossibility just absolutely attracts me. Really? <laughs> and, <laughs> um, and, uh, uh, and incidentally, I think that Alan is right to keep on. Uh, there is something, and eventually we'll break it, and then everyone will say, yes, you did it. I mean, it was hard enough to discover Australia. Mm. Uh, ask Captain <laughs> Cook. <laughs> Now you, in fact, let's talk uh, a bit about your early days, because you mentioned there you left school at 14. W why did you leave school at 14? Well, I, th I came out here uh, from England when I was 12, and um, I was pretty bored with the schooling here when I first came in, into Fremantle, and my father said, look, you know, you're not doing too much work, you better learn something. What are you good at? He said, well, you draw pretty well. I was drawing pretty girls at that stage. And you were, were you? The two of you. It wasn't Betty Grable, was it? Well, you know, I think it was normal. He said, well, maybe you'll make a sign writer. So uh, he rang around, and there was an apprenticeship offering. So he said, look, you better start that job, you see. So that's how I began. You started at the age of 14. Yes, I did. You used to start your apprenticeships then, and uh, at 14 years mm. of age. Mm. What made you, you're a pretty good sign writer, weren't you? Well, I thought so. I was in, I used to do things other people didn't do. Like I'd, what? Well, I designed a, a great dog, for a, which made a dingo flower, and it was an Australian image, and uh, I painted a lot of murals and that sort of thing. Quite different things. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen Mr. Bond's work? <laughs> um, I'd love to see your early work. <laughs> <laughs> But then you went, you, of course, you, you started making... I mean, what, what kind of jobs did you take on that the other people wouldn't do? Because you did some fairly rough jobs, didn't you? Yes, I did. I, I soon very quickly learned that the basic fundamentals of uh, sign writing and painting was trying to work out what you wanted to do uh, before you started. And that was the very beginning of uh, everything I then took on. And uh, it was in this... It gave me an opportunity to uh, do uh, development painting works and I go into renovating. At the same time, I found out that leaving school at 14, you really didn't know very much. And so that uh, I went back to night school, and I went to night school for five years. Did you? What did you take then? And uh, I went to, I did life art for four years. Did you really? Yes, I did. <laughs> and um, <laughs> amongst uh, accounting and uh, <coughs> other um, basic English, that sort of thing. Well, that... there's an interesting point here, actually. I mean, you went through the same training as, as John there. I mean, how on earth is it that, that he ends up with a mural on the wall of Sydney and you've got $200,000 million worth? <laughs> I mean, John, what went wrong in your education is what I'm trying to ask you. Uh, nothing went wrong with my education except that the shift is different. The shift? Yes. Oh. And uh, it's interesting that Alan made money and in the end, money doesn't count. That there's some sort of high idea that he has 
which is well beyond money, and that finish, in the end, he finishes up looking like me. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, Alan, about that. <laughs> well, the, the, you mean the, the high idea being the, the America's Cup, the challenge of that? A high principle, a high ideal, like, you know, it happened in America at the change of the century, like the Mellons and the Rockefellers <laughs> decided that they'd made all that immense amount of money, mm. but that really wasn't enough. That it was something like collecting pictures or doing things on a community basis, which is well beyond money. And I really find that, say, the best of our people, and I'm not going to get into you at this stage, but they get beyond the thing of money, but what an idea can be, and I really think that's what it's about. Mm. Would you agree with that? I mean, is that what you feel, that you have to sort of reinvest your money in, in, in something that you care about? I think so. Uh, quite frankly, I believe that Australia, development in Australia hasn't begun. It's a tremendous continent of resources, where railways and ports and water and mineral resources are going to be developed. I take a pride in being part of that development. Bond Corporation is an Australian company. And we create jobs for people, mm. and uh, and this is what we're all about. Mm. Well, I suppose a lot of people looking at you, looking at the success that you've had from that very humble background that you came from, would want to know, what is there a secret to making money? Tell me, please. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's very, very simple. I think, firstly, you have to have a goal. And you have to decide exactly what you want to do. You have to, do, you have, to have a purpose. And then when everybody else around you says, look, you can't succeed, you won't succeed, you've just got to keep going. You've, not, you've got to put a pair of blinkers on. And maybe that goal is saving $5,000 in the bank. How many people set out to save $5,000 in the bank? And they stop, they get waylaid. Somebody comes up and says, listen, what about coming for a holiday? And they miss the goal. You've got to stick with it. And most investments, you know, there will be, there's be one investment, nine people will tell you it's the wrong investment. And you've got to be sure of your own convictions. And when you've made that, whether it be buying a piece of land, whether it be buying a coal mine, or whatever. You will get a tremendous difference of opinion. But you've got to back your own judgment. You say, I've set out to do this, I'm going to do it. And you know, so many people change their mind. And if they didn't change their mind, they stuck to it, they would succeed. It argues, of course, for, being, for having a gambler's nerve, doesn't it? Because I don't believe I gamble at all, and uh, this is the difference. I think that if you set out on paper a um, simple piece of paper, it can be the back of a uh, cigarette packet, that what you want to achieve. You've got a purpose. Uh, you're not just saying, well, if that happens, it's terrific. That's gambling. You say, if it wins, then I've won. We don't do that. You, by concentrating on it, by purposely working on it, you will succeed. And have you, I mean, I suppose it's easy, and there'd be precedent, God knows, uh, for very rich people to overnight become paupers. Now, A, have you ever been in danger of that yourself? Of, of going broke. <laughs> no, but you know, I've had my ups and downs like any company will. Mm. I mean, the, the world economics, Australian economics, they're tied together. Mm. And if the economy goes down, uh, we will feel the effects of it. But taking the, taking the possibility that, that it could happen to you, as it could happen to any uh, businessman, um, do you think then, on what you just said to me, that in fact you could start from nothing again and make another fortune? Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> I think <laughs> maybe. <laughs> I'm money. like, oh, yes. Well, well, <laughs> <laughs> making money by itself is not very difficult. Isn't it? No, because first of all, you've got to understand that you really don't normally set out to make money at all. You set out to achieve something, that's what I'm getting at. Money comes incidentally. I mean, if, you're, um, if you set out to um, um, uh, develop something or whatever, um, and if you think about it properly, then if, and you will succeed, and it'll be profitable. Mm, mm. What about, what's your attitude to, to money, uh, John? I mean, have you ever wanted to be a millionaire like Alan is? Uh, no, I just wanted to be a lover. A lover? <laughs> <laughs> um. What's you know, wrong with being a millionaire lover? Um, well, I'm working towards it, <laughs> but I find that it's not the same sort of railway track that Alan thinks it is. In fact, in our thing, you're only known by the excellence that you do. But there's one awful thing that happens to us artists, is that, like, our pictures appreciate after we've sold them. Yes. And someone did tell me, God, you'll be marvellous when you're dead. <laughs> um, but, you know, like, I, I am finding that, say, pictures that I did 20 years ago, are like, uh, I couldn't even buy them. Yeah. It's just crazy. Yeah. 
But I, uh, another interesting point too is, is that I can see why you get cre artistic mm. um, uh, and creative satisfaction mm. at the end of a day. Similarly, I can see it with, with Julie as well. She sings a song beautifully she did today, and that's her it's satisfaction as an artist. What I can't quite understand, Alan, is, is what satisfaction you get, because obviously you do, out of being a businessman. What is it? Is it reading a balance sheet? Oh, no. Or I, counting <coughs> the money? Or what? <laughs> do you know, it's the most peculiar thing. You never see money. You don't? You don't know. It's a cashless society. You never actually see money or feel it or what you've got. No, I think it's the challenge uh, to succeed in what you set out to do. I think Australia has great opportunity. We tend to think that only people from overseas can develop Australia. I assure you that we can develop Australia with Australian skills and talents. If we just got to set our mind to it, I get a hell of a kick out of succeeding for something, whatever it might be. If it's the takeover of a company, we set our mind that we'd like to buy this company, we'd like to be in, involved in that particular industry, we know that we're going to go on and develop it. A particular instance comes to mind. Uh, I bought a lot of shares in Santos, the oil company, and uh, it was 18 months ago. Uh, when I brought in that company, we had 156 employees. Today we have 357 employees. We've created 200 jobs since I've been there. And you know, that is a tremendous satisfaction to me because not only we've created the jobs for people, we're getting something done. We're building an oil line down. We're going to make Australia self-sufficient. That gives me a lot more satisfaction than A, a balance sheet, B, money, is to see the actual reward. I'm sure it's the same with a, a singer or an artist. They see it, their actual endeavours. And I think you as a businessman, if you're going to be a good businessman, you'll see your own rewards. And would, would all that satisfaction you just talked about, would that be equal or surpassed if you happen to win the America's Cup? Well, the first is no happen to win it. Australia will win the America's Cup. <laughs> what a... <laughs> what a silly question. <laughs> yes. All right, well, then, I've, I've much enjoyed that. Very stimulating programme, all about Australia and various ambitions and dreams. Julie Anthony, John Olson and Alan Bond, thank you for being my guest tonight. I've much enjoyed it. Till the same time next week, from all of us here, very good night. Good night. <laughs>